Today on One, we'll show you how UCF students and volunteers are helping to repair a delicate marine habitat right here in Central Florida. Then we'll highlight a student club you may not know existed. I could barely change the oil on my car and now I can build one. And later we'll introduce you to someone who was so inspired by our armed forces she spearheaded the building of a commemorative site on UCF's main campus. All this and more coming up on today's show. This is One. And welcome to One. I'm Shandrea Thomas. In this show, we'll bring you stories about UCF, our ties to the community, and the people and places that make us a dynamic university for innovation and discovery. We'll show you everything from groundbreaking research to the arts, both on and off campus, to profiles of our talented students and alumni. In our first story, we'll take you to Mosquito Lagoon at the Space Coast. This treasured waterway is a haven for wildlife and visitors alike, but its popularity has taken a toll on some of the natural inhabitants there, the oysters. Did you know that one oyster can filter several gallons of water in an hour? Well, UCF biologist Dr. Linda Walters shows us how critical oysters are to the ecosystem and the measures she's taking with her team of students and volunteers to bring the oyster population back to life. If we didn't have the oyster reefs, we wouldn't have most of the other species here in the lagoon. This makes it the most critical marine habitat globally that is declining. The fish numbers would go way down because they need the area as juveniles as hiding places. We would lose the blue crabs because they eat the oysters. We would lose um, the shrimp and all those other wonderful invertebrates. We've been restoring oyster reefs and basically there had been a problem with um, dead oyster shells getting piled up due to boat wakes. What we're doing is flattening out those piles of dead shells and laying out oyster shells for the larvae to settle on. It's been a wonderful partnership of having the science with the community that's really concerned about the fate of oyster reefs, not only here in the Mosquito Lagoon, but worldwide. Volunteers just come and sign up to drill shells and to bundle zip ties and to cut mats and to make the mats. It's a great hands-on way to, you know, come in and, and just be able to contribute a little bit. We took zip ties and put them through holes in the oyster shells and clipped them to the oyster mats. And you had to put 36 on each mat and that's pretty much it. The kids love it because they can come in and get their hands dirty. We let them leave with an oyster shell and they're just so proud of it and so excited. We zip tie the mats together by putting donut weights on each four corners so they're laid down flat and they'll stay there. This will allow the mats and oyster shells to be underwater so the larvae can settle on an oyster shell that is actually in the water. Over the last two and a half years, we have restored 37 reefs. We have put out over 14,000 oyster mats and we have worked with probably close now to 15,000 volunteers. People have realized that oysters are one of the most important species that we can find in the southeast of the United States, in coastal waters and in lagoons. They are what we now call ecosystem engineers. They create habitat and substrate that we've documented in Mesquite Lagoon, 149 species minimum are using. The most fun is coming back and seeing oysters that have settled on the mats that we've put out and seeing that you know we have created a habitat for these animals and seeing other animals come to a place that was just all dead. What we've seen is just hundreds if not thousands of oysters that have settled on our restored reefs and coming back a year, two, three years later, you can't even tell the difference between a restored reef and just a healthy reef out here in the lagoon. And here's some great news. Over the last two and a half years, more than 40 reefs have been restored and 15,000 volunteers have all helped out. Now it's not just about hitting the books for our students here at UCF. In fact, there are more than 350 student clubs and organizations that students can join just for fun. One of these clubs spends their time building formula cars and Baja vehicles for racing. Christine Deller takes us out for a test drive. 
Have you ever marveled at the speed of a Formula One car zipping around the track? The first time I drove it, you know, first, second, and third gear down the road, and uh, came back, just the whole body was shaking and a smile that lasted about three or four days. Or held your breath as you watched an all-terrain vehicle tear through the mud and over the hills? These aren't just the daredevil drivers. It, it's just, it's really cool to watch it come from absolutely nothing to here it is. Believe it or not, these are also the students of the Society of Automotive Engineers at UCF. We get to apply our classes and learn the real fundamentals of engineering and what works and what, work, what doesn't work. These SAE club members are carrying on a fine UCF racing tradition. It started back in, I believe, the late 70s. Uh, the Baja program at UCF did quite well. Uh, many first, second, and third place finishes. And uh, back in, I believe, the late 90s, we started with the Formula SAE program. And it's been going pretty strong since then. And every spring, the Baja and Formula teams compete in their divisions against other SAE chapters across the country. There are separate rules for the different competitions, Baja and Formula, and the two teams go to those rules, and then we build the cars according to them, and whatever else we feel like will give us a competitive edge. So, with the usual student pressures of papers and exams, comes crunch time in building and testing these speedsters. You know, we'll come up with a problem that you would never fathom or think you'd experience, and then having to run out and solve them and fix them, you know. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. We'll be out here sometimes way too late, meaning all night, see the sunrise the next day, and then keep working. So how good are these student projects? They're not street legal, but could they zip around the Daytona Speedway? It's amazingly fast. It, you know, the braking is better than any, pretty much any street car that you'll ever drive. The acceleration is on par with, you know, the fastest supercars that are built. And these cars aren't just speedy, they're safe too. You see the two stickers behind you that says Bridge and Stratton Pass Tech. They really grill us on making sure the car is completely safe. I, I would have no problem putting my little sister in this car and letting her drive it around. From the classroom, to the track, to a future in engineering, the Society of Automotive Engineers at UCF takes students from the nuts and bolts to the finish line. I could barely change the oil on my car, and now I can build one. And you can find out more about UCF's own chapter of the Society of Automotive Engineers, including all of their upcoming events, by just logging on to their website at knightsracing.cecs.ucf.edu. Coming up on One, we'll meet a young woman who's making sure that we remember and honor the men and women serving our country. It started as a simple idea to hang a plaque at the Student Union to honor our veterans, but her vision soon picked up momentum. Evelyn Tan turned that idea into something much bigger. We have such privilege attending UCF. I wanted to remind the student body as well as myself and the faculty that there are students and fellow faculty members that are serving right now that aren't in the classrooms. No one in my immediate family has ever served. I just. I get so tearful when I go to a veterans ceremony or meet veterans, I can hardly choke out the words thank you. It's very emotional for me and it's completely from the heart. At first, I just wanted something for students to walk by and see. It turned into, with the help of Admiral Harms and um, just awesome people on board, to, it snowballed into this amazing commemoration site. It has been an absolute thrill to see all of the veterans come out today uh, for this celebration. This is all about them and their contributions and their willingness to give of themselves for the good of others is pretty extraordinary. It's a form of sculpture that uh, I hope will make people take a second look and wonder just why is this here? Truly the, the artistic piece and the show piece are five marble seals. These are the service seals of our five services. The Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, and the Coast Guard have been sculpted in white Carrera marble, are coupled at an end by a huge bronze fitting that encircles the flagpole. So the five services working shoulder to shoulder 
in fact are protecting America. The most important piece, I would say, is the, the centerpiece, which is an 80-foot flagpole on which our American flag will fly. The country is founded on the sacrifices of others, and sometimes that can be lost in translation, um, and the sensitivity level has gone down because we are fortunate. And so a commemorative site makes people reflect. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a major benefit. What most tugs at my heartstrings are seeing students go up to it, figure out what it is, like why it's there, what it says. So that's what I wanted, that's what I hoped for, is, is to draw students and just a little reminder. I think it's so important that we all come together as a nation to honor those that have sacrificed themselves for our freedoms. So just, just to say thank you and we love you and we're so appreciative because I can't sometimes choke out the words. I want that commemoration site too. Amongst the hundreds of active and retired veterans who attended the dedication ceremony were vets who fought back in World War II. Now here's a look at some upcoming events happening on campus and around the area. Thank you for joining us as we continue to make our university one with our community. We leave you with some sights and sounds of the Brevard Zoo.